The pharynx is a muscular tube that connects the nasal cavity and oral cavity to the larynx and esophagus. The pharynx is composed of skeletal muscle and lined by mucous membrane dividing into three parts. The nasopharynx, the oropharynx, and the laryngopharynx. The nasopharynx functions only in respiration, but both the oropharynx and laryngopharynx have digestive as well as respiratory functions. All of these can be seen clearly in a sagittal section of the head and neck. The upper portion of the pharynx, the nasopharynx, lies above the oral cavity here and actually it is a continuation of the nasal cavity and functions only in respiration. Talking about the borders, the nasopharynx is bordered by the upper surface of the soft palate, an uvular, then it draws to the oropharynx inferiorly. The anterior aspect of the nasopharynx communicates through the conchi with the nasal cavities. Posteriorly and superiorly, it is mainly bordered by adenoid tonsils and a muscular structure covered by mucous membrane. Another important structure in nasopharynx is the pharyngeal opening of the auditory tube, also known as the eustachian tube. Let me draw here another diagram to clearly show it. The pharyngeal opening of the auditory tube, which is also called a eustachian tube, is located on the lateral walls of the nasal pharynx here. The auditory tubes connect the middle ear to the pharynx and serve to equalize the barometric pressure in the middle ear with that of the ambient atmosphere. If I draw the adult and the children's eustachian tube and contrast them, it is important to note that the eustachian tube in the children is shorter and at more of a horizontal angle than seen in the adult ear. Therefore, sometimes in a case of dysfunction of the eustachian tube, Infections in the upper respiratory tract can easily reach the middle ear and causes otitis media, also known commonly as inflammation of the middle ear. An integral symptom of acute otitis media is ear pain and fever. In a posterior wall of the nasopharynx, there are lymphoid tissue structures called the adenoids, also known as the pharyngeal tonsils, which are large between the ages of 3 to 8 and then regress. They are part of the so-called Valdez tonsillar ring. So what is the Valdez tonsillar ring? Valdez tonsillar ring is a ring of lymphoid tissue located in the nasopharynx and oropharynx. It includes one or two pharyngeal tonsils, also known as adenoids, two tubal tonsils, which are located posterior to the opening of the eustachian tube on the lateral walls of the nasopharynx, two palatine tonsils, commonly called the tonsils, which are located in an oropharynx, one or many lingual tonsils, which are on a posterior tongue. All of them are part of the immune system. In a clinical practice, sometimes the adenoids may inflame causing adenoiditis. Adenoiditis can be caused by a bacterial infection, such as infection with the bacterial streptococcus. It can also be caused by a number of viruses, including Epstein-Barr virus, adenovirus, and rhinovirus. Inflamed pharyngeal tonsils appear red and enlarged. Acute adenoiditis is characterized by fever, nasal airway obstruction, and rhinorrhea in viral forms of disease. The enlarged adenoids also can obstruct the opening of the eustachian tube, which is located close to the adenoids. The second part of the pharynx is oropharynx lying behind the oral cavity here. Anteriorly, it is mainly bordered by one-third of the tongue 
and by oral cavity, superiorly by soft palate, uvular, and nasopharynx, posteriorly by the laryngeal muscles lined by mucous membrane, and inferiorly by laryngopharynx and superior border of the epiglottis. It is the only part of the pharynx that is seen when you open the mouth. Let me draw here an anterior view of the mouth to make some points about additional structures in the oral pharynx. It is important to note that on the lateral walls of the oral pharynx we have palatine tonsils and as we have mentioned above, they are the part of Valdeus ring. Sometimes the palatine tonsils may inflame causing tonsillitis. Inflamed tonsils appear red and swollen. Symptoms include a sore throat, swollen and red tonsils, and fever. Another common disease of the pharynx, pharyngitis, is an inflammation of the pharyngeal mucosa. This disease is usually a disorder of children. On examination of the throat can be seen a pronounced redness of the mucous membrane of the pharynx. The main symptoms are a sore throat and a redness of the pharyngeal walls. Other symptoms may include fever and maybe a cough. Streptococcal pharyngitis or strep throat is a common form of pharyngitis in children. In addition to the above mentioned symptoms, streptococcal pharyngitis is also characterized by pus on the tonsils. A common cause of streptococcal pharyngitis is a group A streptococcus or streptococcus pyogenes. It is important to keep an eye out for this bacteria because group A streptococcus can lead to rheumatic fever and subsequently rheumatic heart disease and glomerulonephritis. The last part of the pharynx, the laryngopharynx, also known as hypopharynx, is a caudal part of the pharynx. Let me draw here a proper diagram of the pharynx with its surrounded structures and show the borders of the laryngopharynx. The laryngopharynx is here. Here we have the epiglottis and over here is the oropharynx. Right here is your thyroid and cricoid cartilage, larynx and esophagus. Specifically, the superior border of the laryngopharynx is the epiglottis and oropharynx. And its inferior border is the posterior surface of the cricoid cartilage of the larynx. At this point, it becomes continuous with the esophagus. The laryngopharynx communicates with larynx via the laryngeal inlet. One of the most important structures here is the epiglottis, the flap at the base of the tongue that keeps food from going into the trachea. In a clinical practice, sometimes the epiglottis may inflame and causes epiglottitis. Epiglottitis is commonly caused by bacterial infection, most often by Haemophilus influenza type B. Under normal condition, the trachea is open and the epiglottis closes it during swallowing. The swollen epiglottis in case of epiglottitis can totally obstruct the airway causing asphyxia, the most dangerous complication of acute epiglottitis. This disease commonly affects children. The symptoms include fever, difficulty in swallowing, drooling, hoarseness of voice, and typically strider. The early symptoms are insidious but rapidly progressive, and swelling of the throat may lead to cyanosis and asphyxiation. Epiglottitis, in some cases, may require urgent tracheal intubation to protect the airway. Let's repeat one more time whole pharynx by drawing its open posterior view. 
I'm drawing the base of the skull. Here is the mandible. Over here is the coani, uvular. Here are the palatine tonsils, a root of a tongue. Here is the epiglottis. Right here is your esophagus and trachea. The first part of the pharynx, nasopharynx, originates here and terminates here in a joint to the oral pharynx, originating here and terminating here in a laryngeal inlet. As for laryngopharynx, it is a continuation of the oral pharynx, originating here and terminating right here and a joint to esophagus. It is important to note that lateral to laryngeal inlet here there is a piriform fossa which has a clinical relevance which is important to be noted. The problem is that sometimes in a piriform fossa small bones like chicken bone and fish bone can become large. It causes great pain and feeling of choking or gagging. Next, let's talk about the muscles of the pharynx. Now, this is going into a lot more detail, but it is important to know it because they play a role in swallowing and some pathology can occur when there is a disruption of the muscle layers. There are two muscular layers of the pharynx determining the shape of its lumen. The outer circular layer and the inner longitudinal layer. Let me draw here a diagram to clearly show that. The outer circular layer includes inferior constrictor muscle, father is divided into thyropharyngeus and cricopharyngeus, middle constrictor muscle, and superior constrictor muscle. During swallowing, these muscles constrict to propel bolus downwards. The inner longitudinal layer includes Salpingopharyngeus, palatopharyngeus, and stylopharyngeus. During swallowing, these muscles act to shorten and widen the pharynx. Zenker's diverticulum, also known as a pharyngeal pouch, is an outpouching at the level of the laryngopharynx. It is located in a posterior midline at the cleavage plane between the thyropharyngeus and the cricopharyngeus muscle, which if you remember is the inferior constrictor muscle. Zenker's diverticulum causes problems when things get stuck there. The entrapment of liquid or food within the diverticulum may result in globus sensation, dysphagia, halitosis, and regurgitation. And now we will talk about the physiology of the pharynx and see what happens in a pharynx when a person eats a meal. But in more detail, we will talk about it when we discuss the swallowing. As I've mentioned above, the nasopharynx functions only in respiration, but both the oropharynx and laryngopharynx have digestive as well as respiratory functions. When a person eats a meal, and as the food bowels reach the oropharynx, it has three ways to go. Up to the nasopharynx, to the trachea, and to the esophagus. Fortunately, in a pharyngeal phase of the swallowing, as food bowels reaches the oropharynx, the uvula, which is the part of the soft palate, is pulled upward to close the posterior nerves to prevent reflux of food into the nasal cavities and at the same time breathing is inhibited. The bolus further travels down and the epiglottis closes the larynx to prevent the food from entering the trachea. The pharyngeal muscles constrict and push the bolus further to the esophagus.